Hey, listener, welcome to the Comic Relief Podcast. Hope you survived the experience. The Comic Relief Podcast is an unscripted discussion about the pop culture surrounding comic books with your hosts, Uncanny Thomas Logue and Mighty Michael Moran. All right, welcome to the on site version of the Comic Relief Podcast. We're here at SoCal Comics down in San Diego recording live and on the scene. How you doing today, Tom? Doing good, doing good. How you doing, man? Oh, I'm doing great, man. We got a really good turnout. It's just started. Um, actually, they opened it up a few minutes, like 10 minutes early, and the line is already around the building for people to come pick up their comics. It's a long line. So far, it's not as chaotic as last year, but like you said, it's still early. Oh, it's at, at, at the time right now is 9.04, and I mean, 10 minutes prior to when they were supposed to open at 9, it was, like I said, it was already around the block. Yep. They have vendors, they have artists, they have food vendors. We're supposed to have a band playing here later. This yeah, is really, really cool. Corner. Oh, nice, man. Yeah. Yeah, this is really cool. I've never, um, I mean, I've gone to free comic book days at different shops and, and kind of bounced around the uh, county. Right. But I've never seen a comic shop do a big event like this with with vendors and tents and booths. And it's almost, it almost has like a Comic Con type Five. feel to it. Yeah. Not not San Diego Con, just like a, a general, a generally con. speaking, a comic <laughs> convention feel to it. It's very cool. So we'll be doing interviews, we'll be talking to the folks, um, we'll be doing a lot of fun stuff. Sounds fun, man. Excellent. All right, I'm here with the creator and artist of the MAP comic, Chad Cavanaugh. Yes, sir, correctly. that is right. me. Nailed yes, it. you did. You have a comic that, you're, uh, that you've are that you created, and essentially you're, you're playing all parts here? Doing the work of 14 men and Damn. women and children. S- strapping men and yes. strapping women. Yes. <laughs> Not these feebly kind of guys, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. No, no, no spindly arms over no, here. No, no. All right, so tell us about the map, man. Tell us about the story. First of all, thank you for having me. It's Absolutely. a pleasure to sit next to you guys here on this wonderful free comic book day 2014 event i am doing my first ever signing of the first comic book i have ever produced it's called the map it is a post-apocalyptic tale of horror and survival that is uh, set in the desert southwest uh, near the four corners area our protagonist is a uh, a meek little guy you know i wanted to get away from the protagonist that's a former green beret or cop or badass mma champion yeah i like those I wanted to have something different. My guy was a geologist. Mm. He's afraid of flies. Mm. Uh, So he's the most unlikely of survivors. Sure. And so now he's been thrust into this horrific world that's just murderous and lawless and bloody. And he's got to find his way through and survive. Mm-hmm. He does this because as a geologist, doomsday preppers before the world ended would come to him. Mm-hmm. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to make sure that where they were going to dig their doomsday shelter, they weren't going to dig into like a pocket of gas or something and sure. blow themselves up. Sure. Being that he was a geologist with the USGS, mm-hmm. he's familiar with all the pockets of minerals and gas and oil or whatever that's out there. So he was a consultant for these uh He was on the sly. Like, they came to him in confidence Mm -hmm. and private. Mm -hmm. And without them knowing, he was making his own little map of where all of these were. And it was just for fun, for his own... Giggles, I guess you can say. Sure. No, absolutely. Pardon my French. Then the world ended, and he survived, and he's got this map, mm-hmm. the map. And now he's got to get from shelter to shelter without getting destroyed in between. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So do you have a, a, a reason for the apocalypse? Is this a, a nuclear fallout? Is this a... It uh... was it was worldwide war, yes. Okay. In the very opening page, you see a huge crater. Okay. You know, And it, and it states, uh, it wasn't the world that ended, but rather it was our comfortable, easy way of life. And you... You can kind of see a big opening page with just an unrelenting, unforgiving desert, and you see a massive crater from a bomb. Oh, nice. One of many that, that was dropped all around the world. There was not a virus. There was not, um, I don't know, whatever else. There wasn't a tsunami. It was all out war. Sure. And you mentioned horror. Are you going to be doing um, zombies, mutants? Uh, what, what's, I, I what don't does have, the protagonist I don't have, to have zombies and mutants. It's horrifying when you start to read through it and see the things that he's going through and the things he has to do gotcha. and the imagery that's in there. Okay. It is graphic. It's not for kids. It is rated M for mature. However, uh, people will say, oh, well, you know, my kids play video games that are three times as horrifying as this. Uh, well, challenge accepted. <laughs> Stay tuned. Keep buying nice. the issues because uh, it's about to get even worse. 
So you're using um, the tone and the plot as more of uh, the horror side as opposed to using monsters? Yes. I want to avoid monsters. Okay. As much. The people are the monsters. Oh, absolutely. You know, because when you come down to it, you watch horror movies and they're fun to watch and mm-hmm. monsters are fun. And I love zombies. But, you know, human beings are some of the nastiest monsters yeah. out there. Those, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, those are the ones that, you know, you have to They're the ones about. that actually created the ones we like to read about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they spawned from inside of us. Yes. Yeah. Because you don't know, you know, don't know people's intentions. You know, if you, if you do have a monster, it's pretty clear what the intentions are. The monster is going to kill you. Whereas, right. with people, you don't know what their intentions are. And you sometimes have no they're idea. Much more nefarious. Absolutely. Ab- oh, and that's what makes it really creepy. Yeah. And like the things that you discover. I, I've already completed issue two. I'm halfway through issue three. There's been a couple panels that I've drawn that have almost made me cry. Just just the imagery of it. Oh wow. So, Very yeah, nice. it's pretty pretty horrifying. Very nice. But, uh, Very which nice. has been fun though. And then I, I use my mother. As a uh, as a measuring stick, she'll come and she'll see the artwork, and once she cringes and, <laughs> and, and reels back in horror, I know I've done. You know, you got to right? It's funny. She goes, "Oh, you're just so good, and the artwork is beautiful, but can't you write something nice?" <laughs> no, nope, sorry, no, unfortunately, sorry, not. mom. Yes. <laughs> what inspired you to write this comic? I'm a big fan of the post-apocalypse uh, mm. genre, but I wanted to do it without monsters, as we discussed. There's the Cormac McCarthy novel, The Road, made into a movie, and one part of the movie they actually find a shelter and i was like what if there was a guy and the only way he could survive is by finding shelters Mm -hmm. and what if this guy knew where the shelters were because he created a map of all them and he's got the only map and he's the only one that has it and maybe there's some nefarious people that know about this map yeah that's kind of what spawned it i just ran with it from there and uh, it's been it's been a fun journey you know, I'm halfway into the third issue now, and uh, there's no end in sight for it. The ideas I have for it to continue on and on and on are just really endless at this point, which I'm really enjoying. That's very cool, man. I, I really dig the uh, I really dig the concept. It's, it sounds very thank very, you, and, and the artwork's really nice as well, man. I, I appreciate that. I, I enjoy doing it. You know, when I started getting into making comics a little over a year ago, I've always been comfortable with the pencil, mm. but inking was something that I'd never done before. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of anxiety. You go from this thing that can be erased and manipulated to something that's permanent. It's permanent. And so there was a lot of stress involved. Like, I don't want to mess this up. But now I'm at a point where I, I really enjoy it. I have a lot of fun doing the ink. And a lot of times now I'll just do such a rough sketch that I do most of the artwork ink only. Oh, wow. Right. And do all the little fine details Next and whatnot. Level, huh? And um it, it's kind of a challenge to myself as well, and, and I, I love it. What's your, your creative process like? I sat down back in September, and I wrote out 12 issues. Now, they're not in comic book script format, but I wrote the idea for 12 issues. Gotcha. And that was the original template. And the first issue stays pretty true to what I originally wrote. The second issue starts to veer because I'll make, to use a football term, I'll call audibles all the time. Sure, your little tweaks and adjustments. You know, yeah. Absolutely. Because I, I've noticed that what I write down doesn't always translate into very interesting imagery. So I'll have to change it up myself. Instead of what's written, I'll draw something different and maybe change the story a little bit, which is been a lot of fun for me Mm. there's a lot of times where as i'm doing a scene or going into another page an idea hits to make it 100 percent more interesting for a reader Mm -hmm. uh, more suspenseful more horrific something to really make people cringe and i'm like i have to do that instead (laughs) and that's gonna happen (laughs) nice and i still work in the original frame of the story so tell me about yourself man what got you to the point where you decided that you wanted to you know write and draw your own comic i was a singer songwriter here locally in san diego it's uh, it was doing really well i played places like the Belly Up Tavern and the House of Blues. and um, But at some point, it peaked, you know, mm-hmm. getting good radio play to all of a sudden, it's like not a lot of people showing up anymore. And I've got a wife at home with three kids. I, I can't leave her at home with three kids if sure. this isn't going to help us at all. So I had a wonderful experience with music. It stopped, and I realized I needed to be around the house more. And I'm like, man, I've got a great story for a comic book. Mm-hmm. I should start making it a comic. And I did. And that's what got me started into the making comics, which was kind of like February of 2013 time frame. Was and I was recent. working on a different story. You'll see it at the, in the back of this issue number one. There's an advertisement for a, uh, another story that I'm doing mm-hmm. called Bedlam in Trouble Town. And it's a crime noir Sin City style. Oh, cool. And I worked on that. I got 39 pages into it when the idea for the map hit me. So 
Bedlam and Trouble Town got shelved, and the map has been going the full steam ahead since. And so I look forward to getting back to Bedlam and Trouble Town. I just don't know when that's going to happen. Gotcha. <laughs> I'm gotcha. having fun riding this wave. And, and where can people find the uh, the map, or where can they find you or the map? They can find me, you know, here in San Diego. I'm <laughs> not too. I, I stick out in crowds. <laughs> I am at uh, grunt1bcomics.storeenvy.com. Uh, that is my online store where you can purchase the map. It's uh, already shipped to as far as Australia and Germany. So if you're in Antarctica, don't feel like you can't order it. I will send it to you. It may take a year to get there, but you'll get it. But it'll get there. Yes. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. The map underscore comic are my Instagram and Twitter handles. On Facebook, you can find the page. It's called The Map Comic Book. So there you go. Get out there. Buy the comic. Check it out. It's a really good book. The art looks really nice. I'm looking forward to reading it. I'm looking forward to purchase my autographed copy here. It uh, will be if... autographed to <laughs> the man per- I love. Personalized with the man I love. Dearly. With a heart. I would go swimming with you in a hot tub. <laughs> you swim in hot tubs? I just no. sit there personally. No. <laughs> <laughs> they're, just, they're just like weird human soup devices. <laughs> right on, Chad. Awesome. awesome. Thank you guys for having me. Chad Cavano, thank you for coming on, man. Okay, I'm here with uh, Paul Horn, writer, artist, letterer, inker, everything for the Cool Jerk book. How are you doing today, Paul? I'm average. How are you doing? Uh, I'm a little above average. I'm feeling good, yeah. Good. So tell us about your uh, book, Cool Jerk. Well, Cool Jerk is a comic strip that um, the easiest way to describe it, the shortest way to describe it is that it's the exact opposite of Family Circus. Nice. Um, (laughs) The longer way to describe it is it's a uh, sort of an ongoing chronicle of things that I think are funny or worthy of satire told through the voices of my myriad comic characters. And and you mentioned the first got a start in a newspaper. Yeah, um, it got its uh, start with the uh, Reno Gazette Journal in 1991. Within a year, it was distributed through the rest of Gannett newspapers. And so before I took it out of print in 96, it was Mm -hmm. running in about a dozen and a half uh, papers across the country, including Guam. It was a little risky. I wanted to kind of be following the the footsteps of the Gary Larsons and the Burke Brothers, but sure. um, with this whole internet thing, I decided um, that might be a better fit yeah, for me. Absolutely, and uh, also the potential to get anyone worldwide to look at my comics. Gotcha. Now I see that you have about four volumes on your table here. Yep. Are these the, your collected stories, or are, are you still uh, uh, creating both? Yeah. Each book contains more than two hundred strips. Uh, cool Jerk is a weekly comic. A lot of them. Are a book exclusive where um, they've never been online, they aren't online, and they will never be online. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so that's an incentive to actually get something, take it yeah. home, and read it at your leisure. Absolutely. And you also have a book, uh, Doc Splatter, yes. Ominous Omnibus. Yes. Uh, what Doc Splatter is, is an advice columnist of the supernatural. All right, man. So we're about, what, two hours into this thing? One hour. Uh, One uh, well, hour? No. You're right. Sorry. Two hours. Yeah, about two I don't know, hours. I don't know how to tell time. How long has it been for you, man? Uh, it feels like eternity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're about two hours in. Uh, it, it's popping. We got people in cosplay. We got uh, the line for free comics going around the block. Still. It's at, like, still. It's still around. Food vendors uh, up. Food vendor. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that thing. I think that's over there. The truck with the food in it. Yeah, vending. The truck with the food that makes me hungry. Yeah. <laughs> The band is setting up. It's about to yes. get noisy here, so shit will just add to our anxiety levels. It, it, it totally. Absolutely. <laughs> I'd be like, ah. Oh. We had some really good turnout, man. I'm really and surprised. The wind is kicking in. Absolutely. Hang on. Right. Keep talking. So, Maiko is fetching the QR code. Just let it go. Someone will see it and scan it, and we'll have fans randomly. <laughs> Oh, that's littering, dude. Not if someone picks it up. Someone will pick it up and be like, hey, what is this? Well, why would you put it right on the QR code? All right. So, yeah, a lot of people here, man. Looks Still. like the, uh, they got the registers are running at full blast inside. Yeah, they've actually got one person doing cash on the register and, like, yeah. a couple of people using Square to yeah. charge on credit cards. That's so. very, very, very good move, man. We have plenty of booths. You said booths. Okay. Booths. Yeah, no. No, no. So, as you were saying, there are plenty of booths. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of booths, a lot of vendors. Uh, right in front of us, there's uh, uh, some folks, uh, uh, toy vendors that have about three tents up, and they're just a lot of cool stuff over there. Don't man. you Very know one of the toy vendors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'm not sure if uh, Darian's helping them out, but 
Yeah, Darian's over there, an ex-co-worker of mine, helping him out, which is a really cool surprise. Good to see him here. Looks like they will be at Toy Star's second annual Toy Con. So it looks like it's their event, actually. It looks uh, like everything. I mean, it looks like yeah. they've got Star Wars, Lego, Pokemon, DC, Marvel, Transformers, Hot Wheels, Mattel. So if, if you're in the area on June 1st from 10 to 5 p.m., check out the Toy Star second annual Toy Con. That's at uh, 5974 Lusk Boulevard in San Diego, California, 92121. That's pretty cool that they're doing that. They're actually hosting, it looks like, their own convention. So they have a, they have a pretty, pretty big presence here. Uh, San Diego Comic Fest also has a booth up, which is very cool. Yes. Yep. San Diego Comic Fest, they're the guys that threw the, orig the originators uh, of the Comic-Con. The original, yeah, I believe yeah. that's what it is. Yeah, before Comic-Con like blew up and blew became up into a mess. what it is now. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, Anxiety. It was... So these guys are, are kind of going back and throwing an old-school type convention. I think last year was their first one. You can find them at comicfest.org. Very cool. So what we're discussing essentially is uh, is Kevin Smith's uh, script uh, back. This is, I mean, this is back before any of the Superman movies that we're seeing. Now, this is, he, he wrote up a script for the, uh, the the death of Superman and then the, the funeral for a friend, his version, and we're, we're just kind of discussing what um, Kevin Smith's version, Kevin Smith's take, yeah, and how uh, well done it was. And now and I got a question for you. Having having read the script, I haven't read the script myself, right. but I've heard Kevin Smith mention that he's seen little bits and pieces of stuff that was in his script in the newer movies now yes. with Henry Cavill. And, yes. And, 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 and do you do you are is there any like uh, a poignant scene that you see that was like, hey, that was uh, one of Kevin Smith's takes. No, it's more along the lines of like cribbing some of the visual descriptions okay. and stuff because you know how Kevin Smith, when he writes dialogue, it's very clip. Yes. It's very like there's a lot of humor in it. Oh, absolutely. Obviously, there was no humor in Man of Steel. Uh -huh. So <laughs> it was played straight, in other words. And wow. so there wasn't that mm -hmm. in there. But there were there were bits like when you see visually like you know, uh, like with Metropolis and how it's shot, or like how the characters are placed in the film in like sure. orders. I mean, if you if if you've seen it, or you know, had access to that screenplay and seen what it is, then you kind of go, "This seems familiar." Or sure. wow, okay, this is how. Like, if you've seen any of Kevin Smith's movies, you go, you can replace like Superman and you know uh, Zod and go. That's Jay and Silent Bob or something yeah. like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> so far as how the positions them on screen yeah, and stuff. Absolutely. Oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't. I, I, I've never had a chance to read a script. I've heard him yeah. talk about it plenty of times. Oh yeah. And and we're talking Kevin Smith. Okay, so Kevin Smith wrote this script. Uh, are we talking more in the Mall Rats? Uh, I, I'm assuming this is post Clerks, post Mall Rats. Yeah, this is around ninety two, ninety three. So uh, maybe uh, what was he doing? Like uh, chasing Amy around that time? Uh, maybe Dogma? No, no. Dogma's it was more after. like it was definitely before uh, Jay and Silent Bob Strikes Back, but it was definitely after Dogma. Okay. I think, I okay. Think, I think it was after Dogma. Okay. But don't hold me to that because I'm, trying to, <laughs> no, no cause I'm trying to remember. Like I said, he did it, he did it as a as a fan who knows how to write movies. Sure, absolutely. You now, know? now one thing that you mentioned before, you know, before we started recording, is right. is that you felt that uh, uh, Kevin Smith kind of takes his his uh, his nerd cred a little uh, uh, a little rough shot in criticizing. Uh, other works and movies and, and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, why did you mention he, that? Yeah, he's like. There's that show, King of the Nerds. Yeah. Well, he's the, he considers himself the original King of the Nerds. Oh, I see. I kind see of thing. Show. You know what I mean? Like he's Edward the Edward the First, King of the Nerds. Yeah. I mean, who who was really? I mean, I, I would say he definitely has the pull, the fan base. I'm not sure if he was the original, but he was definitely one of the few guys that was actually pulling. You know, right. towing the line for the for right. the comic book guys before you know comic books blew right. up. Right, but there were there were other there were other people there are other people around who um, you know kind of did the same did that before him. It's just that they didn't get the notoriety because um, they were doing other things in the mainstream, like sure. Mark like Mark Hamill for example. You know, Mark Hamill. Um, you know, he did he was a voiceover actor uh, in anime dubs and stuff oh, as a child and all that. Mm -hmm. And you know he grew he grew up part of his life in Japan, so he had a real appreciation for anime and manga and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And he grew up reading comic books. That's why he understood Star Wars, and that's why he became Luke Skywalker. So I mean, he's one of the people you know back in the day who was you know uh, definitely ahead of Kevin Smith who did that. I mean, you look at also um, 
I mean, he won't admit, he wouldn't admit to it, but like Gene Roddenberry, when he okay. was doing Star Trek and stuff, the sci-fi elements. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Um, Lucas definitely, you know, um, like when he was doing um, American Graffiti, mm. because, you know, you saw like comic book references. There are there little, clip, little, little Easter egg di- lines of dialogue in there sure. in American Graffiti where he's talking about like, you know, the comics, the pop culture of the day. Mm. Kevin Smith definitely was one of the first to actually no. wear it on his sleeve and and and, exactly. and make it the um how would you say how how would you say it was it defined him essentially right. where other people were you know right well, well them. the difference for me is you know he he's very um he has a great deal of bravado when he does it yeah but the problem the, the my my main issue with it is that that's all mm-hmm. you know what i mean He's like a nerd guru. He, you know, everybody comes yeah. around him. You know, they climb, they climb the mm-hmm. mountain, and he's like the Dalai Lama of nerds, mm-hmm. and and everybody, you know, bows at what he says. But there, there are people in Hollywood who put their money where their mouth is, literally, mm-hmm. who are, you know, trying to promote the nerd cult, what we call the nerd yeah. culture, you know, and you know, they don't get the attention that Kevin Smith does. And I'm referring to Zachary Levy, Chuck, okay, you know, um, or uh, Fandall from from Thor now, mm-hmm. because. He's a guy who literally empties out his pockets every year yeah. during Comic Con to set up Nerd HQ, and he's doing. You know, it's gotten to the point where he can't afford to do that out of pocket anymore, and he had to do the crowdfunding for it. Yeah, I, I definitely see that. He, uh, I, I do notice that Kevin Smith definitely does a lot of self promoting. Yes, and uh, you know, he has his his little network of guys that he grew up with in Jersey. Yeah, and it doesn't really seem to expand out of that. You no. know, which is fine. You can't blame the dude, but no, not well, at all. I, I see where you're. I see where you're coming from. If you're going to call yourself the yeah the, the king so, of the nerds or, or you know yeah well, you give the, yourself a title. It's, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it's kind of funny because without. You know, we can eliminate the, the the violent violence of this reference, but it's kind of an East Coast West Coast nerd war. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I Where Kevin Smith re- represents the East Coast yeah. and Zachary Levy uh, represents the West Coast. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> and you know, yo, I'm down with Chuck, man. Yeah. Because you know, I mean, not only because of you know what he what he's doing, uh, but because of you know the people that he's getting to quote unquote come out of the geek closet. Sure. You know, I mean, when. When you see his stuff on YouTube for Nerd HQ and stuff, these are people you sit there go, "Are you kidding? That person? That actor? That actress?" And it's like non-obvious people. I mean, uh-huh. you get the genre people like uh, what's that? The lady who played uh, Starbuck, Katie, uh, Katie, um, uh, that played who? Who played Starbuck on Galactica? Oh man! But uh, yeah, everybody knows who Starbuck is—the the female blonde yes, version. Yeah, yeah. But you know, she you know she's embraced being part of the whole genre mm-hmm. culture because she was in a huge hit, you know? Mm-hmm. But there are people that he gets that you sit there and go, wow, really? You know? It's, it's nice to see a lot more, uh, you know, pe- uh, actors and artists yeah. come out and, and, and embrace the culture and then let people know that it's okay to, to be into, like, sci-fi yeah. or, you know like, what I mean? Like, like just this last week. Um, he was, even though he was promoting, you know, Amazing Spider-Man 2, which, by the way, is a good movie. Mm-hmm. No spoilers. Um... Andrew Garfield was interviewed by Jimmy Fallon. And, you know, I mean, here's a guy who's like a, you know, one of the hot, young Hollywood A list actors. Sure. And I don't know if you saw that episode or saw that show, but he, he you know, there, it was Jimmy Fallon. So, you know, he's going to do stuff off center. Yeah. And he, he, he was able to con Andrew Garfield to play a guitar solo. And what does he play? He sings and plays. The Spider-Man animated TV series nice. theme song with the roots. The one that uh, Slash uh, did the, uh, the yeah. guitar piece. No, 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 right? no, no. No, the one from the 60s with the oh, lyrics. Oh, okay. So, okay. so he's singing the Spider-Man theme. Spider, It's kind of weird. Spider-Man singing the Spider-Man theme. But he did that. And nice. here's a guy who, um, you know, in every promotion and stuff you see on, on TV mm-hmm. about, you know, and online about the, the movie, how he got it, it's because he had such a passion for that character mm-hmm. as a child. And this guy's in his early mid 20s and he's, you know, going off yeah, and, and, and and he was pursuing the role and everybody's going, "Well, you know, you're British, you don't sound like Spider-Man." So he hires a dialect coach to sound like he's from Queens. Yeah, he does. And he just he goes did. off. It's amazing, <laughs> you know. And here's the guy saying, "I want to be Spider-Man," not because of, you know, whatever re- the money or whatever, but mm-hmm. because he loves Spider-Man, much like how Sam Raimi as a director, yeah, got the job because he told the producers my mom paid money to get me a Spider-Man mural for my birthday in my bedroom wall, and it's still <laughs> and it's there at still my house. There. Yeah. You know, 
So yeah, I mean, there are people out there out there who are who are like all about it, you know, who embrace the nerd culture. Samuel L. Jackson. Oh, absolutely. You know, you know he's and a he's a he's a bad mofo. You know, he's Shaft for crying out loud. But he's, he said he's yeah he's has a background. In, yeah, and yeah. every Wednesday, he's at. Golden Apple or Meltdown in Hollywood buying his weekly stash yeah. of books. Yeah. You know when, when um, who was it? Was it Mark Millar that did The Ultimates? I believe it was. Yeah, The Ultimates, yeah. Yeah, when they when they actually penciled, you know, they, they created Nick, uh, the Nick Fury that we know, know Samuel L. Jackson was yeah. created in The Ultimates and it was, yeah. I mean, it was just a blatant copy yeah. of Samuel L. Jackson's Nick Fury. Yeah. And, I mean, Nick Fury... Nick Fury, Samuel L. Jackson yeah. saw this. He collects comics. You know, yeah. he, he opened The Ultimates and he said, hey, that's me. Yeah, you know what I mean. So it's yeah. pretty cool that yeah. he came and, and all the way around. And yeah, now and he's he walks. It. He walks. He did this in an interview. He said he walked into their offices and said, "You guys owe me money." Yeah, or part, <laughs> or which is part. it? You know. And the reason here's one for you. The reason why they went to that version of Nick Fury was because David Hasselhoff did a a, a, a TV movie oh, yeah. as yeah. Nick Fury. Now, granted, he was decent. But you still kind of heard Michael Knight in his voice. Yes. You know, when he got out of the gruffy bass voice, yeah. he sounded like Michael Knight a little bit still. But they wanted to distance themselves from that. Mm-hmm. And so they saw Shaft and goes, we want Nick Fury to be tough like that guy. That's why you look <laughs> yeah, at him. Yeah. He's Shaft with an eye patch and scars on his face because he's got the long coat and everything. Yeah, it's, you got the long coat. It's Shaft. Oh, absolutely. It's Shaft running shield. Yeah. And you know what? And, and, and David Hasselhoff, to his credit, he he actually he looks like Nick Fury, man. He played oh, no, he, he played a decent Nick Fury. Yeah, he was at Comic Con the year before that movie. Came. That movie took like two years for Fox to figure out where to put it in the schedule. But uh, at least a year or so before that movie was aired, mm-hmm. he was at Comic Con at the Marvel table. It wasn't a booth back then. It uh-huh. was a table, and he was signing. You know, this is at the height of Baywatch, mm-hmm. and he was signing. He had a he had a prop. Cigar in his mouth, and he wore the eye patch as he was signing. <laughs> and everybody was like going, freaking out, going, Oh, he must have gotten into an accident, he lost his eye. Yeah. And he, then he says in his Nick Fury voice, No, I'm Nick Fury. I, <laughs> I am in charge of S.H.I.E.L.D. And it was great. Yeah. It was awesome because he got it. He understood so, it. So this was before. So Nick Fury, we saw Nick Fury in Iron Man, right? That Correct. was when Samuel Jackson debuted. At the end of Iron Man, the, yes. The, in the post credit scene. Yes. Uh, so, wow, this was it had been right around that time. Mm-hmm. It's very, very cool. Yeah. It's very cool. We're talking to Dexter O'Donnie, right? Right. And you have a blog, Dexter? Uh, no, but... Um, I uh, I have you know Twitter, Facebook, all that like everybody else. I'm on social network. Sure, man. Where and can we then, find you? At? Um, well, if you go to Twitter or Facebook, it's um, DTO David Thomas Oscar two eight six five, and um, I've worked on some stuff in the industry. Uh, I've ghost edited a few things. Um, the big thing I guess I'm well known for if you if you punch in my name on uh, uh, inter- internet movie databases, I worked on uh, I did a project or did some work on Robotech. With the late Carl uh, Masick, um, so yeah, nice. that's my what did you fame. do with uh, Robotech? Uh, I produced, directed, wrote, and narrated a documentary um, about the production of Robotech uh-huh. back in the day, and so this was like right after Robotech came out, just as when it was like the huge phenomenon, and um, I was able to interview some of the actors, mm-hmm. a lot of behind si- behind the scenes people, like the dir- one of the directors and writers, um, people who. You know, scheduled and produced the the show. Um, just a lot of ba- you know, a lot of people didn't have an idea on how that show was made, or any of those kind of sure. shows were made. You know, insofar as animation with actors and stuff. So it kind of serves as a as a primer for for voice acting. Oh, absolutely, you know, absolutely. And, and the production behind it. And um, we were able to uh, dig it up because it, we had thought it had been lost. This was like produced like over 25 years ago and we thought it was lost but um can we find a copy of it online yes actually oh, you can you can um it's now included digitally remastered uh, <laughs> on the latest robotech box set oh no way yeah there's um there's a there's two documentaries on there one of them is the the carl Masick tribute documentary mm-hmm. about all the actors but they're from you know current sure. and everything and they, they're sharing their, their anecdotes and stories and whatnot about how they produced and did Robotech and then mine comes in and it's like done back in 1986 oh that's very cool man and this is before you know home video oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is before um, Adobe uh, Premiere uh-huh. this is back where you know the only way you could do something like that is if you had access to professional grade equipment which I did because I was, I was a film student 
Oh, cool. So I was able to do that as a summer project. And, um, yeah, it, it, it was just one of those weird things, you know. So, so aside, if someone wants to uh, look up this documentary, right, yeah. and uh, let's say they can't get a hold of the, the, the box set, is there, is there somewhere we could download or a link where you could uh, maybe purchase a copy of this video? Um, actually, I think the box set is still available. So through your you know regular retailers, whether they be online or brick and mortar, you just type in um, uh, Robotech com- the complete series. Oh, cool! And then um, there's there's two versions. There's um, one that came out about two three years ago, and then there was one that came out in 2013. And then one for 2013 is the one that has the the documentary in it. There you go. It's go called to- Robotech: The Inside Story. Um, we're in the process right now of of. Uh, Trying to create some another uh, another Robotech documentary, um, but it's not involving any actors or anything. We're sure. we're still kind of ironing out things on it. Cool. So yeah, it's good. It's really cool. And um, uh, the 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 be all end all, the guru of Robotech, uh, Tommy Yoon. This has his stamp of approval on it. Oh, that's nice, man. That's huge. Yeah, it's really huge. Cool, man. Well, best of luck to you, Dexter. Thank you for coming by and talking to us, man. No problem. And um, once again, where can folks find you online? Um, you can find me on Facebook at uh, DTO2865, Twitter, uh, same thing. And um, from there, you know, there are links to other things that I've worked on and images of things that I've done and whatnot. Excellent. Very cool. Good talking to you, man. Right, thank you for thank doing you. the interview. All right. So we got Joel Iliad with us uh, today. He is uh, one of the co-promoters, excuse me, uh, with Ray Reyes of the... SoCal Comic Con. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great, man. It's a really good turnout. This is my the first time I've been here at Free Comic Book Day at, at SoCal Comics, and uh, I'm blown away, man. We've we've been uh, lucky to be invited here uh, almost the entire length of our show. So we've oh, been here the last cool. four years, and SoCal Comics always gets a great lineup, and uh, more people come out every year to get the free books. Yeah, it's awesome. Very impressed. Very impressed. And you you uh, you and Ray are promoting today a SoCal Comic Con uh, out here in. Uh, the north county of San Diego, right? Correct. We decided to... San Diego is known for its giant Comic-Con, and then there's nothing the rest of the year. So we decided it's time to put on a nice family-friendly one-day show just to buy comics and toys, meet your favorite artists, get a sketch or two, and walk away with a good deal. And you guys are going to have the SoCal Comic-Con is October 5th? Correct. It's the first Sunday in October. It's actually the Sunday after the Long Beach Comic-Con, but way before Christmas and Thanksgiving. Nice. And what do you guys have lined up? Do you guys have any uh, any guests? Our guests of honor this year are actually Len Wein and Herb Trimpey. They were the nice. co-creators of Wolverine. Uh, we're lucky that this is the 40th anniversary of Wolverine. Oh, that's perfect. Uh, 1974, we saw Hulk 180. We saw Wolverine leap out of the pages. And we thought it'd be great to bring the two of them together to uh, meet the fans and uh, create a good experience. So, Very nice, very nice. I'm glad you guys are doing this. I, I agree with you that you have Comic-Con in the summer, and then other than that, you have to go to Anaheim, you have to go to Long Beach, you have to Correct. travel outside of San Diego. And I'm a local, so it's very nice to see other uh, these other, you know, Nice cons popping up. Very cool. With named artists, too. We, uh, we've been very fortunate. This is our fifth year. Uh, we've had past guests of honor like J. Scott Campbell, Mark Silvestri, Clayton Crane. We had a creator of Ren and Stimpy come out. Uh, we started in a boys and girls club gym. You know, 40 tables. Uh, got our friends. Got a lot of vendors from the area. and We've just grown and grown. We get about 500 people a year. Uh, to come out, we're free. Oh, that's very good. We we really focus on the family. So first and foremost, kids thirteen and under get in for free. Uh, we have a good military presence in mm-hmm. Oceanside. Oh, absolutely. Camp Pendleton's or military members get in for free as a thank you for their service. We really want to provide that avenue. You can see what comics are like without all of the hoopla and the noise. Oh, absolutely. Um, just pick up a new trade, pick up you know a toy for the kids. We're all about the experience. So. Very we cool. get a good mixture of vendors. Actually, we have IDW Publishing, who's a San Diego local. Uh, we get them to set up a table. We had Top Cow, and Mark Silvestri was was our guest of honor. And so we we, we try to provide a very good mix. Oh, that's very nice. And I'm looking at your flyer here, and I'm, I'm showing that you guys are promoting free grab bags uh, to the first 100 people. And Correct. Then a bunch so of raffles you line there. up in the morning. We stuff it full. We actually do a lot of free comic book day books. Uh, we slip variants in there. We, we slip signed books into our free grab bags. And we do raffles throughout the day, so we we always give away a Marvel number one signed by Stan Lee every year. <laughs> and so in the past, we've given out Daredevil one, Iron Man one, Avengers one, no way, and really? X Men one. 
Wow, so that is they're not necessarily cool. mint condition, but they yeah, are yeah, a, exactly. an original 1960s Marvel number no. one signed by Stan. Uh, we're still working on this Holy year's. Cow. Probably it's going to be Sergeant Fury number one, and uh, fresh from Captain America: Winter Soldier. Got to have Sergeant Fury oh, in there. Man. And uh, we do lots of we do a lot of original art giveaways, posters. Um, we had a Jim Lee resketch hardcover a year ago in our raffle, so. We space them out throughout the day, so whether you come early or you come late, uh, it's a good chance to win something really cool. We had over 50 raffle prizes last year. Cool. Now, I, I know Jim Lee is also a, a local in the area, has been well known. Have you reached out to we Jim? We have reached out to him. Unfortunately, he's really busy running DC Comics. Yeah, it probably is, right? Uh, every year we ask. Uh, we're hoping one year he'll say yes. Uh, he just had his, uh, between him and his wife, his ninth kid. Um, so he's busy also being a dad. Sure. Uh, but he is aware of the show, and he was very. He did a, a really nice resketch hardcover for us a couple years ago, and so we'll see. Oh, but very cool. uh, we try to reach out to creators throughout the area. And and where can people go to find more information? We are at SoCalComicCon.com. We're also on Facebook. Definitely come check us out on Facebook. We do trivia contests. You can get free entry to the show, free prizes. Uh, our Facebook followers that came out today are getting a free signed lithograph. So we definitely, it's all about giving good free stuff out, encouraging people to check out different comics and toys, and just have fun with them. Very cool. There you have it. Go to SoCalComicCon.com. Check them out on Facebook. Thank you very much, Joel Iliad, co-promoter of the San Diego, uh, SoCal Comic Con. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me. Absolutely. Cool. All right, we're here with Jamie Newbold, owner of SoCal Comics and host of today's free comic book day at SoCal Comics. How are you doing today, Jamie? I'm doing good. Excellent turnout today. We've had a, we've had a line around the block, I'd say, since about uh, 15 minutes before this event started, and it has not let up, man. No, this is incredible. I'm not even sure how to count the bodies. We're reasonably certain we had around 800 people last year, but this is way past oh, yeah. that. Oh, yeah. It hasn't, I have not seen this this line die down once. We got... We got food vendors, I mean, we got toy vendors, we got a lot going on here. We got face painting, uh, there's a band playing in the background. Very nice setup, man. How many times have you guys have done this? I believe this is year 12. This is the 12th yeah, uh, they've, free uh, comic book day that you've hosted? Since day one, we've been hosting free comic book day. But the first, uh, first seven or eight years were really lean. <laughs> and then we started exploiting our big commercial parking lot which is empty on Saturdays no neighbors businesses are sure, open sure sure and had people come in and set up to do their own dealing and wheeling in conjunction with what we do and the parking lot looks like the swap oh absolutely only with more crowds yeah <laughs> yeah i mean like i said the line for the free comics books themselves is is around around the block it's very nice and it seems like it, everything's real organized you guys got the 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 parking lot you know chalk outlined you got a nice alleyway going on here. Really dig it, man. It's really good job you guys are doing. How is it inside? I haven't had a chance to go in there. We have to direct traffic in the store. Oh, man. We have five cashiers where we normally have one. Oh, wow. And um, I actually need a couple more people working. We don't have <laughs> Oh, wow. It just got too out of control. Oh, wow. No way. And, and just, you know, maybe some folks haven't seen or haven't been to the... Um, uh, SoCal Comics uh, out here in San Diego. This is a one of the bigger comic shops down here, man. This is a warehouse-sized comic shop. I'm not sure what the square footage is. Our store is uh, made up of four co-joined warehouse suites. I sublease some of the spots, but my square footage is about 3,500 square feet. Nice. How, how long has SoCal Comics itself been in business? We opened officially January 1, 1998. In oh, wow. just one suite, and we let business push us forward into what it is now. Always with the uh, the unnerving fear that we had our grasp had exceeded our reach. Nah, but um, still here. Yeah, we're still we're doing rocking well. it. You guys look like you're doing all right. Yeah, <laughs> no, this is um. What you want to see is returnees. Yeah. I realized from years of this that out of the thousand people, fifteen hundred that might show up, I'll be lucky if fifty come back to shop. Oh wow, in my really? Store. It is just uh, the free comic book thing is what they That's want. That's the draw? A lot of these people have no idea what the concept of a comic book really means. Sure. They think it's eternal return value on eBay. Yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, some, some sort of an investment. We hand for out part. promotable material for comic books and events for the year. And we also hand out stuff that we picked up cheap. 
that has nothing to do specifically with this event. The people who come to get it don't differentiate between what I consider just cheese sure. and then the quality pr promotional yeah, material. They yeah, want absolutely. free and free yeah, is free. Uh -huh. I think if I were handing out gas cans and, <laughs> and fountain pens, it would probably be just as accurate. Yeah. <laughs> It's okay, man. Yeah, I like seeing I like seeing comic books get attention like this. It's been a, a huge upswing with the popularity of all the movies that have come out with the Avengers and the Batman movies and all that. We're seeing kind of a resurgence in the popularity of comics. So, I, I hope you know. As you see, a lot of young people here today, people in costume, uh, a lot of children. I hope comic books and, and, and the books themselves, not just, you know, the movies and the cartoons and the TV shows. I mean, I hope it, it, it does inspire people to, you know, continue collecting and buying, you know what I mean? And coming back to the comic shops. Because uh, the comic shops were struggling for a while there. Right. They were disappearing and it, it's a bit of a resurgence. So it's, it's really nice. This is really a, a nice event you guys got going on here. Comic book stores for a long time had uh, saturated the county. In the 90s that disappeared. By, uh, by the mid-2000s, the, the same 10 or 15 stores, more or less, that occupy the entire county accounted for all the customers because oh, wow. all the customers in San Diego had a place to go. Uh -huh. There were no comic book customers doing without. Mm -hmm. Now there's a proliferation of little stores opening up everywhere, but there's no guarantee there's a exceeding number of comic book buyers to make all sure, those stores successful. Sure. The fear is is that you're going to have stores that are trying to try to create a departure from a regular store to come to their store because oh, they're yeah. just moving the same crowds yeah. around. I've noticed a trend as well as uh, uh, you're starting to get some, some hybrid shops where it's like a gaming slash comic shop and they have tabletop games and you see, uh, you know, they, they try to make events to bring people in, but it, it, you do kind of split the focus a little bit on the comics and, and, you know, you see stuff like that. Which is fine. Gaming is a big part of the distribution network. For Diamond, which supplies all the comic book stores with all their comics all year round, I guess it's called Gaming Alliance. Is this uh, firm business member or business partner with Diamond? Sure. And so Diamond promotes gaming as much or more than they promote the comic books that we live off of. Our store is unique because I grew up with and sell comic books and have been doing so since the 60s. Wow. Doing Comic Con since 1972. Oh wow. As a, and as an exhibitor for 35 years. So I want my store to reflect the fact that my experience with comic books is Comic-Con, oh, and I want a Comic-Con every day, and yeah. that's what my store is. Yeah. Today, it's just that the Comic-Con aspect of it kind of punched a hole through the walls right into the parking lot. <laughs> Absolutely, it did in a huge way. Absolutely. Right. right. Cool. Well, that's uh, Jamie Newbold, owner-operator of SoCal Comics, host of the uh, free comic book day at SoCal Comics events. And thank you for having us today here, man. Thank you for doing the well, interview Well, thank with you me. for being had. Nah, not a problem, man. All right, man. Thank you, Jamie. Thank Appreciate you. it. Yep. Okay, so we're here with uh, Barbara Marker. A local artist here, and uh, you, you are from San Diego, yes, Barbara? Uh, uh, well, I'm originally from Germany, but I do live in San Diego now. Oh, very nice. So, yeah. so tell me about your um, your artwork. I've been doing art all my life. In the 80s, I ended up getting a job with Pacific Comics as a colorist and inker. After that company, mm -hmm. they started as Blackthorn Publishing, and I went with them. And I spent 12 years coloring for Steve Shanus and, and, and oh, Bill very Shanus. Nice. Very nice. I also did some work for Eclipse for Bruce Jones and April Campbell. I did some coloring for them. Blackthorn used me as a colorist, as an inker. I also helped Jerry Bingham color the Batman graphic novel, Son of the Demon, for DC. Oh, very nice, very nice. And I, I did a project for In Color. They were doing the coloring for Aliens vs. Predator graphic novel oh, for very, Dark Horse. Oh, absolutely. And I colored um, a lot of the, the pages for that. I did I, I did the uh, color guides for those okay. pages. Okay. One of the things that was really neat I got to do while I worked for Blackthorn is is we colored a Greeble, the messy monster. It was a, a book project for Amazing Stories, Steven oh, Spielberg's wow, Amer really? Amazing Stories. Oh, that's very and cool. That was fun. Now, what I do is I'm in the Comic Con every year in, a, in Wonder Con mm -hmm. and Comic Fest. So I do a lot of fantasy art and animal art, and I publish my own prints. Yeah, Barbara has a lot of uh, really nice artwork here. A lot of this is commission work, yes? A lot of it's commission. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, she has a, a Green Lantern, a, a He-Man, a Snow White, some very nice stuff, uh, uh, dragons. I, I, I got to admit, I really like your uh, your fantasy stuff. It's Thank nice. you. And we'll, we'll post pictures up on the site as okay. well of some of your artwork. That'll be and wonderful. And she has uh, some covers here from some books like... Uh, you did a uh, cover art on uh, on Betty Boop. You did the coloring on the. I Betty did the Boop. coloring on the Betty Boop. And then Werewolf, Werewolf 3D, Starhawks, which is Starhawks. very very cool that you did that. Thank you. I, I'm, Fate. The, I'm the national comic. I also did the inking. I re-inked. It's from oh, an old cool. cover. I re-inked it as well as colored it. Absolutely, and, and we'll we'll uh, we'll upload some photos of okay. your artwork as well. well. And, and where can they find your your artwork? Do you have an online oh, presence? Yes, uh, I have a website sure. on Facebook. It's barbaramarkerartist.com, and you go to it and um, go to photos and albums, and my artwork is on there in the nice. albums. That's barbaramarkerartist.com. Dot com. Very cool. And and I, I take it your Facebook is probably Facebook.com slash Barbara Marker? Yes. Oh, very yes. cool. Very cool. And it's spelled B-A-R-B-A-R-A, not B-A-R-B-R-A. <laughs> Absolutely. Marker. Definitely want to make that clear. You want to make sure yes. people get to the right place. Yes. So, very cool. Go ahead. Uh, visit uh, her website. Uh, like her on Facebook. Uh, check out her artwork. And we'll be... Uh, posting some photos of her artwork as well. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for uh, listening, and we'll be back with you soon. We're Thank you. Till next time. Thank you for listening to the Comic Relief Podcast. We'll hope you join us next time as we continue to discuss all things comic book related. And until then, make mine Marvel. And see. And independent. Don't forget to check us out at comicreliefpodcast.com or you can visit our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash comic relief podcast or go to our YouTube channel www.youtube.com forward slash comic relief podcast. And finally, there is our Twitter page, which is twitter.com forward slash comic relief podcast. P-O-D-C. I'd like to give a special shout out to Travis Richards, who did the music for the Comic Relief Podcast. Visit his website at www.travisarichards.com. Outro music. Here I am, baby. Doo, doo, doo. Let's do a little. Uh, let's do a little acapella. You ready? Mm-hmm. Um, 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 hit it. Um, um, uh, Michael on the. Oh, sorry. Wicked, wicked, wicked. Wicke. Yes. Yo, 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 yo. Let's do a little. Uh, let's do a little acapella. You ready? Hit it. And don't mess it up. <laughs> Alright, so five, four, three, two, one. You're here at Free Comic Book Day. This is Thomas Lowe from ComicReliefPodcast.com. This is the mighty Michael Moreno. And you're watching the Digital Lizards of Doom. Alright, one more time without looking at paper. <laughs> <laughs> so that was you, sucker. You need to wear that on your shirt. Right? <laughs> oh, like a slogan right there. I love this that is who one. you're listening to. Alright, ready? Five, four, three, two, and four. Hey, this is Thomas Loke from ComicReliefPodcast.com. And my Harley Moreno. Quinn! And you're listening to The Digital Lizards of Doom. Boom! There we go. Oh, nice save, dude. Done. Done. Nice awesome. save, bro. That was that, thanks, man. There you go. That, that one was, that like, that that was perfect, bro. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you in a bit with the game. Bro. Right on, man. Yeah, so, uh, we'll find your podcast here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right right on, on. We got a cross